Before viewing video lessons, it is important to read the textbook using the learning guide as your turn-by-turn -turn directions. Then use the learning guide to take organized notes in your own words with examples and pictures. Chapter 3, The Biological Bases of Behavior. In this chapter, we're focusing on the biological piece of the biopsychosocial model of human behavior, specifically looking at the nervous system and endocrine system. We're going to continue looking at the nervous system in this video. We're going to start with the basic organization of the nervous system. The nervous system is divided up into different components. Traditionally, the first level of division is between the central nervous system, which makes up the brain and spinal cord, and the peripheral nervous system, which are all of the nerves throughout the body. We'll get more into the peripheral nervous system later. Right now, we want to focus in on the brain. And before we talk about the brain, we need to look at how we study the functioning of the brain. So we're going to be looking at Learning Objective 3.5, The Brain and Behavior. So traditionally, the only way we had to study the function of the brain was damage studies or lesioning or damaging the brain on purpose. So for our ancient ancestors, what they would do is when somebody behaved oddly, in life, when they died, they would sometimes look at their bodies to see what was different or unusual about their body. So for example, let's say I was a perfectly normal member of our, our tribe, our clan, our group, and one day I get hit in the head with a rock, and I'm never quite the same after that. My behavior changes. After I died, they could look at the brain and they may notice that a particular part of my brain had been damaged and that would give some clues that that particular part of the brain was in charge of a particular type of behavior. Unfortunately, this wasn't a very efficient way to study the brain. Um, with animals, we could actually damage particular parts of their brains on purpose doing little rat brain surgery. And then after they healed from the surgery, we could kind of look and see, you know, how their behavior changed. This also wasn't ideal because the brains of animals aren't exactly the same as people. But for much of human history, this was all we had to use. Then we were finally able to develop technologies, and these technologies have allowed us to study the brain in very different ways. One way we've been able to study the function of the brain is using electrical stimulation. Now, if you remember, neurons communicate using electricity within the neuron. But one thing we found out is that if you apply a mild electrical current, not enough to kill the neuron, just enough to activate it, so I can externally apply an electrical impulse to a set of cells. It can actually cause those cells to activate and fire so that they will release their neurotransmitters. And so our first way that we were able to do this is we would drill a hole in a person's skull, insert a probe or a thin wire, pass the electrical current down that wire, and then we would wait to see what happened in the person. So I might put the probe in, press a button, and then suddenly their right hand starts flapping up and down. Well, I have just activated motor neurons that control their hand. This is kind of interesting, but some of the problems with this particular research is healthy people didn't sign up to have this done to them. So most of the research done with probes was done on people who had known brain injuries or problems, and we were using the probes to try to help understand and potentially treat their problem. Nowadays, we can actually do electrical stimulation 
without drilling into a person's skull using magnets. So a magnet can stimulate part of the brain. The stimulation is primarily restricted to the outer layer of the brain. So electrical stimulation is one way we've learned more about the brain. The other way that we've learned more about the brain is by actually taking pictures of it, not having to wait for someone to die to look at a brain, but actually see what's going on in a living person. One particular type of picture is a CAT scan. A CAT scan is, a, is essentially a fancy kind of x-ray. It's a still picture of the brain, and so we can use an x-ray to kind of take a picture of a slice of the brain. In this particular example, you can see a tumor in this person's brain. Another type of scan is a PET scan or a positron emission tomography. This uses another type of technology to take pictures. Um, you can see that it's a little bit fuzzy. It's not exactly a perfectly uh, clear picture. One of the biggest differences between the CAT scan and the PET scan is in the CAT scan, the radiation or x-rays come from the outside and go through the skull. In a PET scan, they're actually injected into the person's blood with some little radioactive material, and then that's sort of monitored externally. Okay. The last type of picture is a magnetic resonance imaging, or MM or MRI, I'm sorry. And this is using some magnetic fields and radio waves to take a picture inside the body. Some of you may have had an MRI before of a knee or an elbow or some other sort of uh, sports-related injury. Now, MMRI, MRIs, sorry about that, um, are traditionally just a still picture, so you can just see one moment in time in the brain. An fMRI, or functional MRI, can actually show you activity in the brain. And the YouTube video that's available on the playlist and noted on this slide has a good example of an fMRI. This is an example of the level of detail you can get with an MMRI. As you can tell, the MMRI, the magnetic resonance image, is much more clear and much more detailed than either the PET scan or the CAT scan. Some of you have maybe even had pictures taken of your brain. If you've ever been in a car accident or suspected to have had a head injury, one of the things you'll notice is that they'll want to take a picture to see what's going on. If you ever think you have a head injury, you should always go to the emergency room because they're the only place that has the technology to take these types of pictures. Typically, you'll start with a CAT scan. That's the most frequent one that they'll use. Uh, PET scans are usually reserved for very particular types of tests. And occasionally you may end up with an, M an MRI just depending on the technology available at that particular emergency room. So using these different techniques, we have learned a lot about the structure and the functioning in the brain. In the next video, we will discuss some of the things we have learned using these techniques.